The art world, where paintings change hands for fortunes. Selling at $95 million. But for every known masterpiece, there may be another still waiting to be discovered. Well, that's it. Well, that's it, isn't it? That <laughs> is it. That is our painting. International art dealer Philip Mould and I have teamed up to hunt for lost works by great artists. We use old-fashioned detective work and state-of-the-art science to get to the truth. Science can enable us to see beyond the human eye. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. <laughs> the problem is, not every painting is quite what it seems. I paid about £100,000 for it. That is a lot if it's a fake. It's a journey that can end in joy. <laughs> oh, isn't that great? That's so wonderful. Or bitter disappointment. They are declaring that your painting be seized and then destroyed. In this episode, could a painting hanging in a Welsh castle be a work by the Impressionist master, Pierre-Auguste Renoir? Two powerful art houses can't agree. The rivalry between the two great houses is now out in the open, and I have to say, it's ugly. Our investigation takes us to an Impressionist playground on the banks of the River Seine. We could be adding another paragraph to art history. To Giverny, in search of Claude Monet's art collection. We need concrete evidence that it was here, somewhere, in this house. And to Berlin, to see what state-of-the-art science can reveal. But will we find enough evidence to convince the art world's toughest judges this painting is genuine? I can't cope with this roller coaster. In this investigation, we're on our way to Pembrokeshire. We've received a call for help from the owners of a painting with a mysterious past. It hangs in one of the finest stately homes in Wales, Picton Castle. Built at the end of the 13th century, it was home to the Phillips family for 800 years. Now the castle is open to the public and it's maintained by a charitable trust. Nikki Phillips is one of the trustees. Great to see you, Nikki. <laughs> Hi, how are you doing? She's an artist in her own right, famed for her official portraits of the royal family. I first met Nikki when I followed her at work painting war hero Simon Weston after BBC viewers had voted him the public figure most deserving to grace the walls of the National Portrait Gallery. Some years ago, Nikki was painting a portrait of her late Aunt Gwen when she was told a tantalizing story. How a picture came into the family collection that was said to be by one of the world's most celebrated artists, Pierre-Auguste Renoir. Wow, quite a flash of color in here, isn't it? It's lovely. Just take us back over how it came into the family. It was bought by my great-grandfather, Lord Milford, and he was very interested in the Impressionists, and he bought this picture along with a fair few others. And I was told by my great-aunt Gwen that she was taken to Monet's studio by her parents, where they were sold it as a Renoir, because, um, as I think is well documented, Monet and Renoir used to paint together. And then at the end of the day, they would sometimes swap their pictures. Who did they actually buy it from in the studio? I'm told that Blanche Monet was there at the time. Monet's I don't know whether stepdaughter. Monet's stepdaughter. I don't know whether they actually bought it there and then, um, or whether it went subsequently through a dealer. I'm not sure. I can see why this painting would have caught Sir Lawrence's eye. It's an engaging scene, but is it a genuine Renoir? He's one of the world's most famous artists whose works can sell for millions of pounds. Born in 1841, Renoir became one of the leading lights of the Impressionist movement. He said he never went a day without painting and through a career spanning six decades, he created over 4,000 canvases. But is this painting one of them? Not all experts have been convinced it's authentic. So how did it first come to be doubted? When the roof of this place needed doing in the 60s, there was a sale of the other Impressionists that were in here. There was a Monet and a Sisley and a Pissarro. And this one had to be left out because it, 
It's not signed. So this one turned out to be the, the, the lame duck of the group and, and for 50 years or more has, has been considered to be a wrong picture, a, a problematic picture. Not for the family, because we all know the story. Mm. <laughs> what would this painting be worth if it was by Renoir Philip? Well, if it could be proved conclusively, two to three hundred thousand. Mm. Yes, well, that would help hugely. <laughs> With the roof and all the other bits that yes. are falling, yes. falling down, falling off. Mm. There's a lot at stake here. Picton Castle may look magnificent, but beneath the surface the cracks are showing and funds are needed to maintain the building. So imagine Nicky's delight when a leading art world authority, the Bernheim Jeune Gallery, included the painting as genuine in a recently published catalogue listing all of Renoir's works. But there's a problem. Another powerful art world authority doesn't agree. This is by Renoir. It was sent last year to Christie's, and they said that it was going to have to go past the Wildenstein Institute, and they're doing their own catalogue raisonné, and they simply said they didn't want to include it. And I'm told the uh, auction houses will go with the Wildenstein decision. I mean, it's an extraordinary state of affairs, because a picture that should be worth two to three hundred thousand pounds now it can't be sold as a Renoir, despite the fact that it's mm. in a catalogue raise of 2007, right. because another publishing house and authority say it's not. So, the investigation begins. One of the problems is there's no documentary evidence to back up Aunt Gwen's story that the picture is a genuine Renoir. A trawl through the castle archives is not proving helpful. Well, this is a Christie's inventory of Picton Castle from 1995, and it mentions the painting attributed to mm. Auguste Renoir, so not by Auguste <laughs> Renoir. Then we've got Sotheby's, dated 2003. Again, attributed to Pierre Auguste Renoir, cannot confirm authenticity. Mm. Regarding the Renoir painting, Renoir in inverted commas, the then authority on the artist concluded that the painting was a copy. So there's quite a lot of doubt here. Hmm. I have to say, I really like this painting. Everything about it feels right. I mean, this is what those early Impressionists were up to. It's, it's about light, it's about colour, it's about feeling, it's about, it's about life on the move. The more I spend time with it, the more I feel comfortable. This has to be by Renoir. But that's just my opinion. We need to find hard evidence that Renoir painted our picture, so I'm sending it to the highly respected Courtauld Institute in London for forensic analysis. In past tough cases, we called on the services of Aviva Bernstock, one of the world's leading authorities in the scientific study of art. Armed with cutting edge technology, she can reveal clues hidden within the canvas. So, give me your first reaction. Well, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a nice, light-hearted sketch, painted at speed, and perhaps even in one go, um, from start to finish, out of doors. And thus not untypical of the type of works that the Impressionists were doing and, and, and their approach to subjects. Yeah, it's absolutely characteristically like an Impressionist sketch. And it, it actually looks like it's been done with quite a narrow range of pigments, but of course I'd, I would need to look more closely at them to, to know what they are, uh, using the microscope and other techniques. Aviva needs time to undertake a thorough technical analysis of the painting, a series of tests which will determine how it was painted and with what pigments. Her research could provide vital evidence to prove whether our painting is by the master Renoir or another hand. We're meeting with our specialist art researcher, Dr. Bendor Grosvenor, to assess the evidence. Well. Here's a photo of the man at the centre of our mystery, Pierre-Auguste Renoir. And very fine he looks too. Surely the way to go forward on this is to have a really good look at the picture itself. Shall we start with the back of the painting? And if we look here, we have an unfortunately damaged, but nonetheless rather important stock number, uh, which seems to match up with some information in the Renoir catalogue raisonné. Stock number Bernheim Germ 26863. Now, Bernheim Jeune published an exhaustive catalogue raisonné in 2007 of Renoir's works. It's five volumes, I've got one volume here, and it records 4,654 paintings, including one of them, which is ours. There it is. 
And the thing is, Bernheim Jern is an important name. They were major art dealers in the Impressionist movement at the time of Renoir. I mean, their authority should carry clout. And in fact, the authors of this catalogue raisonné, who are called Guy Patrice and Michel d'Urbeville, are the descendants of the Bernheim Jern brothers. This is Gaston Bernheim Jern with Claude Monet. This is Joss Bernheim Jern with Cézanne. And I love this photo. This is Renoir painting Joss Burnham Jones' wife, and in fact, Renoir painted a number of portraits of the Burnham Jones family. And given the closeness of their relationship, not just as friends, but also as dealer and artist, they will have accrued a wealth of documentary evidence about Renoir's paintings. And if you look at what's in the catalogue resume about our painting, it's incredibly detailed. So, Acheté par Bernheim Jeune, so bought by Bernheim Jeune on the 10th of February 1937, à Blanche Monet, that means from Blanche Monet, for 40,000 francs, and then vendu, sold on the 21st of April to Tooth, and that means Arthur Tooth, the well known, reputable English art dealer. Now, with a rich provenance like that, that should be more than enough to prove the authenticity of this picture. But it isn't, because the other international art authority in this particular story, the Wilmstein Institute, there it is on the right, are compiling their own catalogue of Renoir's works and they will not accept our painting as genuine. And the thing is, the big international auction houses need a stamp of approval from the Wildenstein Institute because if they don't get that, neither will they accept a Renoir as genuine and they won't sell it as such. So we've got a picture here which has fallen into some sort of bizarre art world turf war accepted by one authority, but rejected by the other. But as we found again and again, the art world can be a law unto itself. And unfortunately, we've got to play by the rules. We've got to find sufficient evidence to satisfy the Wildenstein Institute. First, to the scene of the crime. I've come to France with Nicky traveling along the River Seine in search of evidence to support Aunt Gwen's story that Renoir painted this work alongside Monet. Renoir and Monet met as students in the 1860s and became lifelong friends. As young men, they began experimenting with light and color, working side by side, often painting the same views. They developed a new style of painting that would bring about a revolution in art. Impressionism was born from their work together. You go beyond the bridge just a little bit further. I'm taking Nikki to the place where her picture is meant to have been painted, a suburb of Paris which was once the Impressionists' playground, Argenté. I want to share an exciting discovery with her. In 1874, the year that the Impressionist movement first officially began, Renoir and Monet embarked on a series of pictures together, painting the same scene. Pretty well where we are now, probably moored in their bateau atelier, their studio boat. So this is the Monet, and that's the Renoir. Both unquestionably the same scene, but Monet is about, about much more demonstrative, clear brushstrokes. And then Renoir, on the other hand, he, he blends his paint, it's much softer. It's, it's feathery. And have you noticed? That one is on the side, like yours. Oh, I like that. That is good news, isn't it? And, like yours, it's a sketch, I think, and, yeah. uh, you know, and appears to be unfinished, not quite resolved. He hasn't quite got there. Doesn't deserve a signature yet. And, and my guess is if we're going to prove yours is by Renoir, it's going to be an unfinished work, a bit mm. like this. This is progress. Renoir said he never signed his sketches, which could explain why Nicky's painting doesn't bear his name. But there are others we can look at. I mean, painted pretty well from the same spot. Different mood this time. I'm holding the money, you've got the Renoir. Isn't that fascinating? That is literally the same scene. I think Renoir might have learnt something from his friend here, because these brush strokes are much bolder than usual. And Monet could have painted those, couldn't he? You know, you're talking like an artist now. Aren't you? <laughs> now, it was thought when they finished these works that that period of working in tandem with each other, painting the same scene, ceased. They went their different ways. Not so. I can show you something rather thrilling. Here is a Monet, and here is your Renoir. Oh, so, look at that. Isn't that fantastic? Now, these are unquestionably the same scene, like the pictures, the pairs of pictures that we've been looking at up till now. 
That is the same evening as even the man in the boat. I always thought there had to be a pair to this picture if Aunt Gwen's story was correct. And here it is. I mean, it must be. And if we can get your picture accepted, not only does it mean that we've got another Renoir, but unknown to the art world out there, there's another pair of pictures by these founding figures of Impressionism painting side by side the same scene. We could be adding another paragraph to art history. Well, when you put it like that, that is very exciting, isn't it? <laughs> wow. If Aunt Gwen's story holds true, Renoir gave his painting to Monet, who eventually took it to his home in Giverny. Monet moved here in 1883 and created these glorious gardens, which have captivated generations of visitors ever since. In 1936, 11 years after Monet's death, Aunt Gwen said she came here with her father, Sir Lawrence. Here they met Blanche Monet, who was custodian of Monet's house and studio. We're following in Aunt Gwen's footsteps to try and find evidence that our painting was once hanging here among Monet's art collection. Oh, this is wonderful. Just beautiful, isn't it? Imagine when all the pictures on this wall were genuine Monet's. So obviously, these are copies. It would have been breathtaking. Wouldn't it? And imagine Aunt Gwen walking in here when she was, yeah. what, 21? Yes. She came here with her parents and said it was just the most exciting thing. You know, the studio of the great man in those days, it must have been incredible. And she spoke to Blanche. Um, and I guess our picture was probably sitting in the corner somewhere and they spotted it. Well, Blanche Monet, th there's a picture of her here when she was 17. Blanche Monet was related to, to Monet in, in a slightly complicated way, in that her mother married Monet, so she was his stepdaughter. But she also then married Monet's son, Jean. So she was, at the same time, Monet's stepdaughter and his daughter-in-law. Immersed in the family. And also she was an artist. A successful artist, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, she wasn't a dabbler. It was something she took very seriously. Her work was exhibited. And she painted alongside Monet. Can you imagine what that must have felt like? Because, of course, he was incredible. at the height of his success <laughs> and his fame at this point. Imagine having the opportunity. Blanche was devoted to Monet. For the last 12 years of his life, she lived here and cared for him, enabling the ageing artist to complete his last great works. After Monet's death in 1926, Blanche remained at Giverny to look after his home and extensive art collection. There are accounts from visitors who marvelled at the many works by Monet and his fellow artists that hung here. And I've been searching for any mention of Nicky's Renoir. There's a reference to the art collection in this book here, written by René Gimple, who was an art dealer. Let me just read this extract. He says, we returned, all three of us, to the house. He'd come here with some friends. Passing through the kitchen, decorated with pretty blue tiles of a delectable cleanliness, into the dining room, covered with Japanese prints, hung on walls of a unique yellow, painted by Claude Monet. For the first time, I went to the first floor, into the bedroom with its walls covered with canvases by the artist's gifted friends. Oh, how wonderful. There are admirable Renoirs. Yeah, I like that bit especially two small horizontal ones, a woman and child on the grass with a hen to their right, and another of the same size of a woman on a sofa. At the head of his bed, a nude by Renoir, very fine. The two Renoirs were given to Monet. Well, that verifies her story, doesn't it? Aunt Gwen's story, it certainly does. This is so tantalising because it's getting us closer, but what it doesn't have is a description of Aunt Gwen's painting here at Giverny, and that's what we need, concrete evidence, that it was here, somewhere, in this house. We need to find out if there is any record of Monet's art collection. So we've asked to meet with art historian Claire Joyce, who was married to Blanche's nephew for over 40 years. She's written and lectured on life at Giverny, so I'm hoping she has some answers. Claire, hello, hello. Fiona, nice to meet you. This hello. is Mickey Phillips, hello, hello. whose painting we're investigating. We're trying to find out uh, any details we can about what collection was here when Monet died in 1926. Did he leave a will, first of all? 
No, because, you know, Michel was the only son left. Monet yeah. had two sons, Jean, who died in 1914. And so Michel was the only child left. So everything went to Michel. And so everything went to him. Was an inventory done after his death of everything here at Giverny? This is not known at all. So no will, no inventory that you know of. This is it's it's not, not looking good. Not looking great. There must be someone who knew about exactly what was here at Giverny. Monet had, like every Frenchman or, or any French woman, a lawyer, which is called a notary, who keeps a record of what you own, and you keep the, the same notary all your life long, normally. So if there is any record left uh, for Monet, it's at the notary's place. So that's what we need to do then, try and find the notary, mm. or the office of the notary. Mm. While Fiona hunts for proof the painting was in Monet's art collection, I'm in Paris on another lead. I've come to the Musée d'Orsay, home to one of the world's greatest collections of Impressionist art. There are prize Renoirs on display, but I'm here to see other treasures that are hidden away from view, precious relics that could prove crucial evidence in our investigation. This is one of the holy grails of Impressionism. This is Renoir's actual paint box, the pigments, the colors, and the palette that he used to mix his paints to create those wonderful paintings. I mean, the palette is so fascinating because that's, that's the first stage in the thinking process. This is where he, he tries out the paints. And there's one particular stroke, a, a, a lovely sort of shiny yellow, which maybe in my imagination, but I feel it can only be a stroke by, by Renoir. It's that soft, quick, glancing blow that he does with a sable brush. But there's something even more exciting. And this is a list in Renoir's own hand that comes from the archives of Durand Durel, who were one of Renoir's first dealers. Now, it's produced in about 1877. In other words, quite close to the date of when our picture could have been done. And it lists the actual ingredients, the pigments, the colors that Renoir uses in his pictures at that date. Now, this is invaluable evidence. If we find these ingredients in our picture, then it's going to help enormously. If not, it could be a problem. Back in London, at the Courtauld Institute Library, Bendor is on the hunt for any evidence to support Aunt Gwen's story that the painting came from Monet's art collection. He's trying to find a record of the sale of the picture from the dealer Arthur Tooth to Sir Lawrence. This might give us proof of where it came from. He's got some news for Nicky. Hello, Nicky. Hi. I had a little look in the ledgers of Arthur Tooth, which are split all over the world. They're in California and the Tate Gallery in London. And if I start off with this one here, I can show you there's a purchase ledger from Burnham Jeune in April 1937 and it shows that the Tooth Gallery paid 85,000 French francs for a painting by Renoir called Bassin d'Argentoy, 1875, which is... Has to be the same one. Your picture, mm. that picture. Now we come to the interesting thing because we then go to the sales part of the ledger here. We can see that uh, the same painting, Bassin d'Argentoy, by Renoir, was sold on the 1st of June 1937 to great-grandpa Sir Lawrence Phillips. Oh, my God. And also, I like this fact that they've got here for the provenance, it says in brackets, from the collection of Claude Monet. Which backs up Which my great-aunt's story. Backs up the family story, yes. Mm. Um, what might not be such good news um, is when you find out uh, the price here that your great-grandpa paid for the painting, and he paid £1,250 for it. So <laughs> we've got quite a nice little markup from uh, poor old Blanche Monet, um, getting her 40,000 get francs, mm. no, which is about 380 pounds, to uh, your great-grandpa <laughs> paying 1,250 pounds for it. Wildly over the odds, probably, for something that's not signed. Well, you could, that's, a, that's about the price of two average houses in 1937. My God. So, okay. okay. Well, I'm sure Arthur Tooth would have been able to justify the price very easily. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. And um, just so there's absolutely no doubt at all that we're dealing with your picture, there is, in fact, a little photo here from... Uh, the Tooth archives, they have also had a photographic ledger, and of course we can be absolutely sure that it's your picture because there it is. 
So with the name underneath. With the name underneath, yes. Mm. Sold to Sir Lawrence Phillips. Well, that's absolutely wonderful. Please yes. don't say but. <laughs> well, there's no but at this stage, no, because we've got a, an established paper trail on the provenance going all the way back to Bernard Jones, the people who write the Renoir catalogue resume. So everything they say that the picture came from Blanche Monet seems to all be corroborated the by the paper trail. Mm. The documentary evidence is stacking up, but what can the science tell us? Armed with Renoir's list of pigments, I've come to Berlin. We've sent the picture here to undergo some cutting-edge analysis. Aviva has invited me to the Bruker Corporation, who manufacture state-of-the-art scientific instruments. This place smacks of Q's den in James Bond. The machines they produce here are designed to identify the makeup of anything from explosives to drugs to diseases, even works of art. They've agreed to scan our painting using a brand new piece of kit, which will tell us whether the pigments used are right for Renoir or wrong. I know we're in the presence of an extraordinary machine. I'm really pleased to be here. It's the first time that I've had a chance to see this amazing machine in action. There's only very few of these instruments in the world, and everyone in my field is queuing up to use it. With the scan complete, it's time to see our painting in a completely new light, where every individual ingredient the artist used is mapped out. I've never seen a painting look quite like this. It's absolutely amazing, and what I'm doing here is looking at images of the distribution of different elements in the painting, and those elements correspond to pigments. I've brought up barium, titanium, and zinc, and they seem to correspond to restorations to the painting. You can see damages to the edges and a tear mend in the middle, which have been retouched. So we can see the scars of its past, which I find really comforting, because that's exactly the sort of history I would expect a picture of the 1870s to have. Yes. That's encouraging, but I need to cross-check Renoir's list of pigments from the 1870s with those present in our picture. He said he painted with a red pigment called vermilion, but has the scanner detected it? What I've done here is I can select mercury, which is one of the major elements in vermilion, mercury sulfide pigment. And here's a map of where the vermilion is used mm. in the painting. The masts of the boats, for example, and the reflection of water. Which is, of course, consistent with what Renoir said. Positive progress. Next on Renoir's list is cobalt blue. One of the ways of checking that here is to click on the elemental cobalt map which corresponds to all the areas of blue. Well, it certainly is the main blue pigment that he used for this picture. That's another one on his list of pigments that he used. Yes, and it's interesting also to note that it's said that uh, later on in the 1880s, he dropped using cobalt blue in favor of ultramarine pigment. But it's still important, though, isn't it? Because that was the color that he was using in the 1870s, the very decade that we think our picture was painted. So far, so good. But there's one more pigment I hope the scanner has detected because Renoir only used it at very specific times in his career. What I really want to know about is does this painting have chrome yellow? Because that's, of course, the very material that we know through documentary evidence that he used but abandoned in the late 1870s. OK, we can look at the chromium map. And there is indeed chrome in the painting, but what I should point out is that chrome is present also in viridian, the chromium oxide green that's used a lot in the picture for the boat and uh, the reflection under the boat and elements of the mid-ground, but the light green, which I thought was a mixture of cobalt blue and a yellow pigment. We can now see contains a lot of chromium, so I can be quite sure that the yellow that's mixed with the blue is chrome yellow which was exactly what I was praying for. That completes it, that shows that all the materials that this picture is made of were the ones that we know Renoir was using in the 1870s. Bendor is on the hunt for the inventory of Monet's art collection. 
which under French law should have been made on his death in 1926 by his family lawyer or notary. Now, it's taken a little bit of digging, uh, but I have managed to find out who Monet's notary was. There's a chap called Monsieur Baudray. He is, of course, long since dead. However, his office still exists, or his successor office. That's the good news. The bad news is they've sent me this email, and it says, First of all, I assure you that our office was in charge of Monsieur Claude Monet's estate. The inventory of the paintings was established by our colleague from the town of Andelis. They told me that the said deed was destroyed during the war and that there is no trace left. So that is not good news. However, all is not lost. I found another lead which Fiona may be able to follow up. I'm in Paris with Nicky, hot on the trail of Bendor's lead. He thinks he's located another record of Monet's art collection. If our painting is in it, it's job done. Nikki, this search for an inventory of Monet's art collection has been driving me crazy. The reason I brought you here is because of something discovered in this book. This is from the Musée Malmontan, which is the Monet Museum here in Paris. This is a chapter about Monet's art collection at Juvigny, and this quote is what caught our attention. The inventory drawn up by Durand Ruel on Monet's death gives a precise account of it. So here is an inventory of Monet's art collection. Oh, that's amazing. By Durand Ruel, who were art dealers in Impressionist work at the time, particularly in Monet and Renoir. They clearly drew up an inventory. Your painting, I believe, should, should be in it. Oh, thank God. And the reason I brought you here is this building contains the Durand Ruel archives. And I think the answer to our quest could lie in there. Oh, please. You ready? <laughs> yes. Come on. Let's go. <clears throat> It's a rare privilege to get access to this precious record of Monet's art collection. Very few people have ever seen it. I have got such butterflies. I'm not surprised. <laughs> this is from Durand Ruel's archive. And in here is Durand Ruel's inventory of Monet's art collection after his death. Be very, very careful with these pages. So this is it. Atelier de Monsieur Claude Monet. Now, here it lists the paintings. Now you can see all these are by Claude Monet. Obviously we're looking for Renoir. Amazing. These are all by Claude Monet. God, I wish I could do this much work. <laughs> yes. I really do. I know, prolific. These are all again by Claude Monet, little water lilies. Wow. God, fascinating. We're up to 132 now. So far, we've only seen listed works by Monet himself. But what about the many paintings he owned by his fellow artists, including Renoir? Here are some other names. Caillebotte, Vuillard, Pissarro, Manet, Signac, Sargent. Again, Claude Monet, so Renoir is not here. I know, <laughs> I know. OK, here we go. Here we go. Renoir, OK. La Casbah, I think it is. Yes. 1881, OK, that's not yours. Renoir, femme au divorce. Another Renoir. Woman, femme en fossil your lap, so woman and child on the grass. If our painting is listed among these Renoirs owned by Monet, then a picture with no value could be worth £300,000. Renoir, portrait of Madame Monet. Renoir again, a nude of a young girl. Renoir again, portrait of Madame Monet standing. Renoir, Wagner, must be a portrait of Wagner. Okay. There's no Renoir here. No Renoir there. Oh God, Nikki, your painting's um, not here. Don't. I, oh God, I your painting's not here. I can't cope with this roller coaster. Let me just. Okay, let me just double check. I'm just going to double check. Monet. Monet. Monet again. Kaibot Vuillard. Monet. It's not there, is it? It's not here. I'm sorry, because I, I did... I thought this could be it. So did I. <laughs> oh, 
What a nightmare. It is a nightmare. Oh, God. Could this be the reason why our painting has not been included in the Wildenstein catalog? With our hopes dashed, the team are regrouping to try and find a way forward. It feels like we've hit a serious setback. I mean, I looked through the inventory of Monet's art collection and our painting is not there. And yet everything we have learned about our painting tells us it should be there. Well, the good news is it's not the end of the road for us because the Claude Monet inventory is incomplete. There are, in fact, six pictures by Renoir now hanging in museums around the world, which we know from other sources used to hang at Giverny. And they are missing from the Claude Monet inventory. So if these paintings are missing, our painting could be missing too. Well, I'm, I'm very much hoping it could be. And I have a theory as to why. What if our picture wasn't part of Claude Monet's collection, but what if it was part of Blanche Monet's collection? We know she had her own art collection. We know that Claude Monet gave her paintings of his own, which she later sold. And intriguingly, in the Renoir catalogue raisonné, there are two pictures which have Blanche's name in the provenance. One of them is this picture here on the left, uh, Regatta at Argentoy, which is now in the National Gallery of Art in Washington. And the other picture is, of course, our painting. So if the painting is Blanche's and not Claude Monet's, then of course it wouldn't appear on the inventory of his collection. Why would it? Yeah, it's a neat idea. But I have to say, without any documentary evidence, it's not going to cut it with the Wildenstein Institute. And I wonder if they are entertaining a rather more sinister idea about this painting. Could you um, pass me that book there? Because we know that Blanche was, uh, she was an artist in her own right. She was a very keen artist. She painted alongside Monet. This is her with him here. She often painted the same views as Monet. And I've got here a diary written by René Gampel, who was an art dealer who knew Monet and Blanche, visited Giverny often. And there's an entry in here which gives you pause for thought. He's recalling a conversation with Durand Ruel, another art dealer very well known to Monet. And he says, I asked Durand Ruel if she signed them. What he meant was, does Blanche sign her paintings? There we are. He replied that she did, but that we'd better be on our guard. Although her canvases aren't yet passing for Monet's, they certainly will. So is the suggestion from the Wildensteins then, Nicky's picture is a Blanche Monet painting that has been attributed later on to Renoir? Well, there's no evidence to suggest that's the case. I don't believe it is the case, but I'm wondering if that's what the Wildenstein Institute is thinking. I'm afraid I, I don't subscribe to this at all. I mean, I've been looking into Blanche's work, and there is no way that her work could be confused for a Renoir of the 1870s, which is when we're looking at. Now, look at this picture here, for example. This is one of hers. Up close, the paint is so different. It's thick. It's almost treacly. There's a feeling of heaviness. Now, look at ours. There's a feeling of lightness, a feathery touch. This is not, surely not the same artist, but if the Wildenstein Institute are even considering that this picture is by Blanche Monet, then we've got to find the evidence now to blow that idea out of the water. If we're to prove our painting isn't by Blanche, we need more evidence. So I'm heading back to the Courthold Institute We've exhausted all lines of inquiry except one, which I've asked Aviva to help us with. The painting has been relined. It's had another piece of fabric glued on the back to strengthen it. Not unusual for old pictures. But this could be hiding potential clues on the original canvas. Using a special camera, Aviva hopes infrared radiation will penetrate through the relining to reveal anything that might help our case. So far, I can't see anything. I didn't want to get your hopes up, but no. it's not looking very promising. Well, I don't know about you, Nikki, but I can see something very faint there. What yes, it, there are Nikki? a few marks, but it's a little bit across the middle there, isn't there? Yeah. Mm. It doesn't look terribly definitive. No joy so far. All we can see is a faint smudge on the original canvas. There's one other technique I can think of. We can actually shine the light through from behind the picture, transmitted infrared. And sometimes, because the ground isn't there to stop the infrared radiation to reflect it, we might give this technique a better chance of seeing something. No pressure, Aviva, but we're running out of places to look for clues. Well, I can see clear as a bell what looks like 
Oh, some, oh letters. my God, yes. There. Square by square, an infrared image appears on the screen. But what have we uncovered? It's a really wonderful some letters. Work, There's it? some letters coming up. It's <laughs> isn't it? It's so good. It's a stamp. Yes, it is. The, the letters are, are as clear as a bell, it's aren't a canvas, they? It's a, a canvas stamp. Well, this is incredibly exciting, isn't it? I mean, isn't this just exactly what we're looking for? We'll see. Aviva takes some time to research the stamp. She's got some news for us. So what have you been able to establish? OK, so firstly, this is the whole image in transmitted infrared light. So you can see the stamp that's quite big, actually, is right under the boat, or it's under the, the, the mast of the, of the boat. And if we flip it around, you can see that we can read it is indeed a stenciled um, manufacturer stamp, the Forge Carpentier, who were very famous artist suppliers. And it's 6 Rue Halivi, 6 <laughs> Paris. Oh, for <laughs> everything we need, short of an email address. <laughs> so, what, so this is astonishing. So you, you've got here the exact name and address of the supplier. Yeah, it's, it's remarkable. And what's interesting is that this address is quite specific to a particular date for La Forge Carpentier. Um, they changed their stamp, and thanks to a former postdoctoral fellow here at the Courtauld, Pascal Labrouche, there's a database of stamps, which you can see here, um, from different time yeah. periods. I wonder if you can see which one is the closest to what we've seen. Yes, that one looks very close. That's a dead it ringer. Is. It's exactly <laughs> the same. It is indeed. And what do we know about that label at that time? Well, this is a label which was only specifically used um, between the dates of 1871 and 1879, where they're at this specific address in Paris. What is our picture? 1874, if it's by Renoir, which I think this helps us to conclude even more. I mean, it's a wonderful so piece of right. evidence. It is amazing. So it's certainly the right date range, but furthermore, this, in fact, is a stamp that is on the back of a painting in the Musée d'Orsay uh, by Renoir, from no. the same supplier from 1873. Signed Renoir. I don't believe it. So we can say, we can now tie together so that, that particular lovely. supplier with yeah. Renoir's painting. Now we've got a, a sort of stamp of approval that, that puts us bang in the date we want to be. Yes, and connected with Renoir. Progress. <laughs> That's Progress. incredible. That is absolutely it is. amazing. It is. It's really exciting. It's a really exciting discovery. <laughs> oh, my God. So, anyway, who else could have done it if it wasn't him? Well, I mean, I agree with you. I mean, it's, 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 it's absurd to suppose that Blanche Monet could have done it. She would have been, what, about nine years old at the time? That's ridiculous. You'd have to be quite cynical to believe mm. that. So Blanche couldn't have painted our picture. But I want to be sure Renoir is still firmly in the frame, so I've asked for another opinion. Anthea Callan is one of the world's leading experts on Impressionism. For over four decades, she's written and lectured on Impressionist techniques and has particular expertise in Renoir. If Anthea gives our painting her blessing, then it will greatly strengthen our case. But if she finds a problem, we could be in trouble. Despite the serene appearance of this painting, we've had some choppy water with it. What do you make of it? Mm. You know, there are, I think, difficulties with it. The proportions of the picture, the proportions of the object in the picture, are awkward in places. In particular, the larger boat on the right here, which is our kind of key focus in the composition, is rather large in relation to the little boats in the background, so there's this very sudden jump from foreground to background. And the little figure there is also rather too large for the size of the sailing boat. And because it's so thinly painted, it has a, a real feel of being unresolved unfinished, but that may be intentional. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily assume that this is anything more than a study, a preparatory study perhaps, but more likely um, an exercise where the artist is learning how to paint en plein air outside in the landscape. So actually very difficult to do. Bantha, you are an established Renoir expert. If you were on the Wildenstein Committee, 
and you were presented with this cold, how would you respond? Well, I would think that it's not a great painting, but I would nevertheless think it was a Renoir. Phew! Because <laughs> it looked like it wasn't going to go that way for a minute. So you think it is a Renoir, but it's a rather poor Renoir? Yes. Renoir did produce a lot of second-rate paintings, in addition to being a genius. And do you think that's the crux of the problem with this painting, then? Because we are grappling with trying to understand why uh, Bernard Jean have listed it in their catalogue raisonné, but the Wildensteins don't want to include it in mm. their catalogue critique. Do you think that's what the problem is? Well, it does have a convincing pedigree, and quite frankly, I don't see any reason to doubt the Bernheim Jean attribution. But they have, so why do you speculate that they've turned it down? Rivalry. Do you think that's what it comes down to? Just I think that. it probably does, yes. That's a pretty poor reason, isn't it? Hmm. Have you come across this before in the art world? No. <laughs> Rivalry in the art world? <laughs> The disagreement between these two great art houses is something we've got to confront. So I'm heading back to Paris. I'm on my way to the Bernheim Jeune Gallery, once one of Renoir's most trusted dealers. Their descendants have carried on the family legacy, taking three decades of painstaking research to produce their five volume Renoir catalogue resume. I'm keen to know how they'll react when I tell them the Wildenstein Institute have rejected a painting that they've listed as genuine. I'm here to meet Guy Patrice d'Aubeville, one of the authors of the Renoir catalogue raisonné and a descendant of Bernheim Jeune. Now, this is one of the grandest of the French art houses, and generally they don't grant interviews, they keep their secrets close. Very unusually, he has said he'll see me, but he won't let us film the meeting. These art houses, they do not like any questions about their systems and process and certainly not about their catalogue raisonné. So it could be quite a prickly meeting. The meeting goes on for a tense hour before I emerge a little wiser as to what's going on. And it doesn't bode well for Nicky's painting. Well... The French are the masters of diplomatic small talk, but not in that meeting. I mean, the Dobervilles really dropped their guard. And when I asked them, why would the Wildenstein Institute not accept a painting that is in the Bernheim Jeune catalogue, Mr. Dobervilles said they'd be thrilled to turn it down. Ravi, they'd be thrilled to turn it down. So there was a real bitterness there. And the rivalry between the two great houses of Wildenstein and Bernheim Jeune is now out in the open. And I have to say, it's ugly. At a nearby cafe, I'm taking a moment to reflect on what was quite a meeting. I think the one thing that came out loud and clear from that meeting with Guy Patrice d'Aubeville and his daughter is pride. Pride in the heritage of Bernheim Jeune, pride in their catalogue raisonné. They have no doubt that Nicky's painting is authentic. It's here in their catalogue. But what they also did, and I cannot tell you how rare this is, is they showed us their ledger. And that is their ledger from 1937. And it details when they bought this painting from Blanche Hoche de Monet on that date. And it has a picture of the painting as well. These art houses never let people see their ledgers, but they have let us see this because that is how passionate they are about this painting and that it is genuine. In their minds, it shouldn't even be questioned. It's in their catalogue resume, and that's the end of the story. Back in London, Nikki has been busy at work in her studio. We need to interrupt her because Guy Patrice d'Aubeville said something that's been troubling me. What he told me could place our entire investigation in jeopardy. We're heading to see Nikki for a frank and honest chat. Hi there. Hello. Hello. It was quite a tricky meeting with Bernheim Schoen. The good news is that they have absolutely no doubts about your painting. What they said to me, and this is why I want to talk to you today, was that by us making this program and publicising the fact that there is a difference of opinion between the Wildenstein Institute and Bernheim Jeune as to the authenticity of your painting, we would make it harder for you to sell it. Oh, my God. And that we might be damaging your painting by, by publicising this, mm. this dispute, if you like. What about 
the route of trying to persuade the Wildensteins that it is what we think it is, or hope it is. That has always been from the start, what we were going to try and do. But we felt we had to, to be up front with you and say this is what they're saying. Yeah, of course. And, and therefore, do we carry on? It's very difficult for me to say immediately I'd have to consult the other trustees. Um, I think at the end of the day we've, we've got this painting which um, has no value as it is at the moment. I mean, what Bernard Jean is saying about, you know, by publicising the, the, the difficulty around this painting, we are damaging it. Your painting is already damaged because you've tried to sell it and you can't. Yeah. It's not a pleasant situation, and I think the only thing that we can really positively do is just point out clearly all the facts, as objectively as we can, and let the art world decide. I hate the thought that it's caught up in the middle, this, because I've always absolutely, genuinely felt this picture was real. It fits with our family's story, and um, just by looking at it, actually, uh, that day on the Seine, you know, seeing the place it was painted, I really felt part of what he was trying to do. And I don't like the thought that some quarrel is getting in the way of that. It, it's very depressing, that side of it. Nikki has consulted with the Picton Castle trustees to decide the way forward. After careful consideration, they've agreed to submit the painting to the Wildenstein Institute for reappraisal. The picture has been sent to Paris so that it can be examined once again by their Renoir committee. Nikki is on her way to deliver our dossier of new evidence. I'm incredibly nervous because there is a lot at stake. The castle really depends on this. I so want it to, to go the right way. It's very, very important for us. We've done all that we can. But is it enough to change the minds of the Wildenstein Institute? We have one agonizing week to wait. At last, we have a decision from the Renoir Committee. Nikki is on her way to meet us, and we're all about to discover whether the Wildenstein Institute have accepted the painting as a genuine work by Pierre-Auguste Renoir. To my absolute satisfaction, we've proved that this picture is by Renoir. And we've established that there is a companion painting to it, just as Aunt Gwen said, that is by Monet, his friend. We've established that the pigments in it are the same as those that he used in the 1870s by Renoir's own account. We found a hidden stamp on the back that proves that the canvas comes from his supplier in the 1870s. And we've got an unbroken paper trail that goes right back to Blanche Monet. In art world terms, that is more than enough evidence. Surely now, the Wildenstein Institute must accept this. I think we've made a compelling case for this painting, but it is caught between the pride and tradition of these two grand houses of Bernheim Jean and Wildenstein. And I'm worried it's not going to survive that clash of titans. What I sincerely hope is that, with our investigation, the painting is allowed to speak for itself and shine. Hi, Nikki. Hi. Oh, my God, this is it. Oh, I've just been so nervous, I can't tell you. Well, this is the moment we're going to find out if, if our investigation and all the hard work has paid off. And, and just remind us what's at stake here. Well, with what we now know, if the Wildenstein Institute agree to accept this picture, I could see a major dealer or auction house now selling it for in excess of, of £300,000. Wow. I mean, this means a lot to, to you and to Picton, doesn't it? Mm, huge. It's really huge, this. The house needs it very badly. I've got the verdict here. Our Paris-based researcher rang through to the Wildenstein Institute and spoke to them and she has written down what they said. So, we haven't seen this either. Are you ready? Yes. <sighs> the Renoir Committee at the Wildenstein Institute 
will not accept the painting as authentic, nor will they include the work in their catalogue critique of Renoir. There are three reasons for this decision. There is no evidence to support the provenance of the painting. There's no documentation to prove the work is by Renoir. The painting is not signed. The painting is weak. Even if the work is unfinished, it does not fit with Renoir's style. God, Nicky, I don't know what to say. I don't either. Oh, I just find that absolutely extraordinary. The dossier was so complete. We had a perfect case. Mm, I agree. It feels to me like they've been looking at a different picture. I, I just can't see where they're coming from. I just, I just feel so... I just feel so bad for you, Nicky. What are you going to do now? Well, I'll have to take the verdict back to the Trust and um, look into what avenues there are, if any, that we could take. But I guess, meanwhile, this picture will continue to hang on the walls of Picton. Yes, it will. Absolutely, it will. I love it. It's still a Renoir to me and to the family, actually. We all have always known it to be that, and I still think it is, and I don't care what these people say, frankly. Whilst Nicky can hold on to the fact that the painting is still listed as genuine in the bernheim Jeune catalogue raisonné, without the backing of the Wildenstein Institute, it will not be accepted for sale by the major international auction houses. I think the decision by the Wildenstein Institute defies all logic. And I believe the only thing that would have satisfied them and persuaded them to change their mind was if we had magically found a letter from Renoir saying, my dear Claude, as in Monet, uh, I give you this painting as, I don't know, thanks for my stay with you at Argenté. I mean, I th honestly, I think that's the only thing that would have done it. And as, as you know, that kind of documentation is vanishingly rare. I'm, I'm genuinely disappointed with the Wildenstein Institute. You know, who's the loser? Of course, Nicky is the loser. So is, of course, Renoir. I mean, because this was an important little painting documenting the beginning of Impressionism. It still is. But these are the rules of the art market. And, unfortunately, this time we've lost. Hopefully, next time, we'll win. We ask E. Wildenstein to comment on Mr. Doberville's remarks that the Wildenstein Institute would be thrilled to turn down a painting which was in the bernheim Jeune catalogue. Mr. Wildenstein said, if the opinions in each work, catalogue and article differ from one to the next, this concerns only the authors themselves. These differing opinions, which are inherent to all research, allow for mutually respectful scientific discussion and a better understanding of the artist in question.